Welcome to today's episode, where we'll dive deep into one of the most fundamental topics in clinical trials, randomization. We are excited to walk you through not just the what and why of randomization, but more importantly, how we actually do it in real studies. This isn't just a theoretical topic. Randomization is one of the most important procedures that protects the validity of clinical research. And when done right, it helps generate reliable and unbiased data. So let's get started. Welcome to the GCP Mindset channel and all topics on clinical research. Let us start with understanding why randomization is needed. Imagine you're running a clinical trial to compare different treatments. This could involve two different drugs or maybe the same drug at different doses. No matter the setup, we need to assign each patient to a treatment group. But how do we do that in a way that's fair, unbiased, and scientifically sound? The answer is randomization. Now, to really understand why this matters, we need to talk about bias, something that always comes up in the context of clinical trials. Bias is any factor that can unfairly influence the outcome of a study. And if we want to answer research questions accurately, like whether a new treatment is more effective than the standard of care, we need to avoid bias at all costs. Randomization helps us do just that. It prevents selection bias, ensuring that the decision about which patient gets which treatment is completely uninfluenced. Every participant in the study has the same chance of receiving any of the treatments under investigation. This also helps ensure that both treatment groups are comparable in terms of characteristics like age, gender, or disease severity. The result? More generalizable outcomes and stronger, more trustworthy conclusions. Let us now move on to how randomization actually works in practice. So how do we implement randomization in a clinical trial? It's a process with multiple carefully coordinated steps, and it starts early during the protocol development phase. First, we write the protocol, the master document of the study. This is where we define all the study characteristics, including whether randomization is used, and if so, how. These details include things like allocation ratios, blinding and potential stratification, such as by site or patient subgroup. Next comes the randomization plan. This is a separate detailed document that describes the exact procedure used to generate the randomization list. It includes the randomization algorithm, often block randomization to keep treatment group sizes balanced, and outlines any stratification parameters. It also clearly defines roles and responsibilities, like who will generate the list, who will have access to it, and how blinding and emergency unblinding will be handled. The plan often includes a dummy list as an example of what the real list will look like. From there, a statistician writes a randomization program, software code that can generate the actual randomization list. This program is then validated by a second statistician to ensure accuracy. Once validated, the program uses a random seed, a special code that determines the specific order of treatment assignments. This seed is critical because it allows the list to be reproduced exactly if needed. For this reason, it must be kept confidential. The randomization list itself includes a randomization number for each subject, the assigned treatment, possibly the site number if stratified, and in case of a block randomization algorithm, block identifiers. The randomization number will appear on the labels of the study medication to ensure each box is correctly linked to the intended patient. Who gets access to this list? Only the statistician who created the final list and who should not be involved in the analysis, the data manager or IRT administrator, and the labeling vendor. Everyone else, project managers, site staff, monitors, should not see the list to preserve the integrity of the study. Once created and validated, the list is securely uploaded into the IRT system, Interactive Response Technology System, where patient randomization will be carried out. Only after this can the first patient be randomized. Let us now talk about what's different in blinded trials. Blinded studies require even more care. In a double-blind trial, for example, neither the patient nor the investigator should know which treatment is being given. That means even more effort to restrict who has access to the randomization list and unblinded personnel should be assigned. Only unblinded personnel, like a specific statistician or data manager, can handle the list. Their identities and roles must be clearly defined in the randomization plan. And at the end of the study, 
The data needs to be unblinded so that final analysis can take place. This unblinding should follow a predefined procedure requiring sponsor approval and documented confirmation. There are also situations where emergency unblinding is needed, for example, if a patient experiences a serious adverse event and the treating physician needs to know which treatment was given. Again, this must be handled according to the protocol. Let us now consider special situations that can arise during the study. So far, we've described the ideal linear process, but real studies aren't always that clean. Here are a few special cases to keep in mind. One common scenario is when new study sites are added after the initial setup. If the sites weren't included in the original randomization list, an updated list must be generated. That means going back to the program, validating it again, generating a new list, and uploading it into the IRT. Another case is when the randomization strategy defined in the protocol turns out to be impractical. Maybe something doesn't work as expected during implementation. In such cases, we can't just change the randomization plan. We need to amend the protocol itself. And finally, let's wrap it all up. We've seen that randomization is not just a technical task for statisticians. It's a collaborative process involving medical writers, data managers, project managers, labeling vendors, and more. Every step requires communication, validation, and planning. It's not enough to say, hey, I need a randomization list and expect it to magically appear. There are many steps, and if any of them are rushed or skipped, the consequences can be serious. As we've experienced ourselves in past studies, even a minor communication gap, like a misunderstanding with a labeling vendor, can derail a trial. So, the key takeaways? One, plan early and thoroughly. Two, know who is responsible for what. Three, protect the randomization list at all costs. Four, respect the rules of blinding. Five, communicate constantly and clearly. Randomization is the safeguard of clinical research integrity. When it's done right, it allows us to ask and answer research questions with confidence and ensures that our conclusions are built on a solid, unbiased foundation. Thank you for watching our video, and we hope that you found it informative. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel for more content on clinical research.